We were just uh, reflecting on your, your days uh, in Maitland and, uh, you know, having grown up here in Cape Town, um, you know, and just really uh, having to go and study in your late 20s and, uh, you know, studying, what was it, engineering at some stage and you had a big love for music, but now you're the guy crunching numbers at, <laughs> at SARS, as it were. Uh, and, and we were just reflecting on, on what an interesting time it, it must have been. I know you there was some chatter about you retiring from, from SARS a short while ago and now you're on contract again. The president asked you to stay on and keep the ship uh, running, as it were. Uh, I, I suppose, you know, for for somebody like yourself to almost ask, where are you in life? You know, <laughs> how are you, how are you piecing together what has most certainly been a very interesting journey? You know, the life at the end of the day, I guess I live by the maxim that uh, you cannot reap where you haven't sown. And so you, we have to be prepared to make sacrifices. You speak about the days, um, in Maitland, those were difficult days. Kensington, uh, growing up in poverty, uh, you know, walking next to your shoes and putting in plastic bags to, to to make sure you don't get water into your shoes because it was the only pair of shoes you're gonna have for the last for the next two years. In a in a way, at the time one doesn't appreciate that, but when you look back, you realize how that has helped you focus on the value of things, not the price of things. And today we live in a world of instant gratification where young people aren't always prepared to uh, to make the investment and the sacrifice. So I think that has shaped one's life. And then together with those beautiful lessons of our parents that we cannot live for ourselves only, we have to be a blessing and make the world a better place than the one we found it in. And my dad, who worked at the um, at the city council, here in Nabini, he was a slave driver. So from him, I learned the ethic of hard work. And so those valuable lessons, which actually shapes your values and your character, is what is timeless and enduring. And they still guide me today uh, in this job that I do. Yeah. And, you know, what an interesting background it most definitely is. And, and I'm hoping at some stage, um, you know, when, when when you do leave public service, I, I want to have a conversation about this very fascinating life that you, you've you lived and your love for music. And we can talk about how being a choral conductor, you know, played some some sort of role, uh, you know, in, <laughs> in, in shaping just, again, this love for music and so on. So I quite look forward to having that personal touch with you at a, at a, at a later stage. But nonetheless, let's get into why you are here to join us today. Um, I, I want to start off by, looking at how healthy um, you know our revenue collection is it seems very healthy uh, you've had some booming uh, days um, you know in in which um it would appear that, you know, we the, the state is is recovering funds that are being made, um, you know, and and this and and the and and the sort of taxes that must be collected therefrom. But it also appears that some of that windfall that you have had isn't necessarily because certain sectors are performing great. It's also because of measures that are being put in place to ensure uh, quality control, to deal with the tax evaders, etc., to deal with the uh, financial outflows, to deal with the industry such as the tobacco industry and others in which you know taxes you know aren't being paid in the way that they ought to be paid and so I'm wondering when I look at this windfall of of funds that have been made in terms of revenue collection what do you owe that to well you will recall that in 2019 uh, SARS had according to the Nugent report and my own experience, been severely compromised by decisions that were taken at the time uh, by various leaders in the political and in the administrative sphere. And it had been deliberately weakened, or to use the words of Nugent, um, there has been a decline in governance and integrity. Uh, there was organizational design arrangements that were tried and tested that were dismantled. Many senior experienced people were marginalized um, or were forced to leave. Over the last five years, and then of course, because of that, there was a decline in revenue as well as a decline in public trust. And public trust is sacrosanct for an organization such as uh, a revenue uh, a tax collection agency. And so that's the underlying work that doesn't necessarily immediately have 
a positive impact on the revenue, but begins to address the institutional integrity, but also provides sustainability in a better performance that we have and currently are witnessing. So making sure that we dealt with leadership issues, exiting leaders who were part or complicit or compliant uh, to that era, bringing in leaders, bringing in new skill sets, making sure people are aligned to, we developed a, a leadership model uh, that we use and measure ourselves against uh, reconnecting with our employees, improving employee engagement. So it's not one big one big thing. It's many, many little things that you do. Now, let me share with you some data points in that regard since you asked. Public trust in SARS in 2019 was 48%. I am pleased to share with you that after the work we have done, public trust in our recent survey had, had, has, had gone up to 75% from 48%. Taxpayer service as measured by objective criteria was 55%. We have improved that to well over 80% now. Um, attitude towards compliance by taxpayers was 66% and we've increased that to 77%. And our own employees, we've improved our engagement from 61% to almost 70%. So, so this is the underlying things. And people don't really measure this. They look at the big number with that we announced uh, once a year. But actually, below the big number sits the hard work, getting 12,500 employees aligned, getting leadership who are focused. And we're not declaring victory. We have a long way to go. Um, and that is really when we announce our revenue results uh, underpins that. But of course, there's also specific compliance work that we do. Um, and there I can I can share with you, for example, that um, we announced at the end of last year that we had over collected by 10 billion uh, compared to the minister's last estimate in an economy that was fairly sluggish. So I can share with you that of that, we had to resolve more than 2 million cases of outstanding debt. People don't pay their debt just because they've been assessed. Um, many people do, but, may, but we have over 2 million cases that we've resolved last year. And that work alone yielded 95 billion rand last year. Then when people submit their returns, we have to assess them. If we detect that there's any uh, irregularity there, we engage with the taxpayer, either get additional information, and then we adjust the final outcome, and that either results in, an, in a refund, or a refund is disallowed, or an additional assessment is raised. You know, the old due by you or due to you. Now, in that regard, we cannot anymore. 20 years ago, we had about just under over 5 million returns that we, uh, taxpayers that we were registered. Today, we have over 30 million returns that we have to process. You can't do that with human beings anymore. So we've had to make our entire system digital. We receive the information online. And then we have computers, supercomputers that does the calculation to produce the outcome and then take the outcome through another risk engine to detect if there's any fraud risk or any impermissible refunds. Just that work, body of work, which is really data-driven from third-party sources um, and using machine learning algorithms, just that work has produced almost 100 billion rand of additional revenue. And so I can take you through specific sets of actions that we take, ensuring general compliance, looking at uh, syndicated crime, conducting lifestyle audits, all of this work collectively last year added over 260 billion of additional revenue to the fiscus. So on the one hand, it's the institutional integrity work that I shared with you. Mm -hmm. It's reconnecting and building public trust, but there's also very specific hard work. Over 20 million engagements with taxpayers during the year, whether it is a follow-up call, a friendly reminder, or a very serious letter uh, of engagement or attaching an asset all of these engagements is cumulatively what results in the revenue outcome. 
And we've seen uh, efforts to to increase these uh, different ways to try and ensure that there is the the sort of collection that is due and owed to the state to the point where you've now appointed and issued a tender for for some work to be done with a panel of of tax specialists um, to to come on board to essentially explain to you how people are avoiding paying taxes. Um, you know, experts have called it a masterstroke move to appoint a, a private sector tax practitioners to, to pursue tax dodges and those that do avoid it altogether. How do you envision this to work and what, what will be their focus? So let me say a few things about us using external help. Um, so SARS works with um, a whole range of firms from basic uh, uh, contact center uh, debt collecting agencies through to more uh, specialist uh, people who understand the tax system uh, well enough to engage with the taxpayer on outstanding tax compliance issues through to uh, using accountants and lawyers. So it's across a range of, of, and why would you do that? Firstly, we would bring on uh, skills where we have a shorter need or a project. Uh, so for example, uh, last year and this year, we, br we brought engaged uh, debt collecting agencies. We upskill them to understand, you know, uh, it's different from a, furniture retailer phoning you for your, your, your outstanding debt. This is now more technical debt. So you have to explain what is a tax debt? How did it come about? Uh, there's, there's components of that. So it's, there's some training that we have to give, but once we've trained them, then uh, we the law allows me to outsource some of that work to them. Then in other areas um, where we may, recruitment often takes long. Uh, especially if it's specialized skills. Um, and so we, we therefore occasionally go to, uh, to the market as we do now to bring in skills on a shorter term while we are building long-term capacity. Our ultimate aim is to build long-term capability, but a good recruitment of a highly specialized skill can take up to a year. In the meantime, we have a short-term need. So that's really what we do across a range of work. And I do suppose you'll look at some of the guys that may well be working on this, um, you know, uh, new approach while you build that long-term capacity to see what sort of skills you can possibly retain with a full-time contract. I, I would I suppose that could, you know, be one of the ways to, to try and build that long-term capacity um, moving forward. Um, and, and again, it will be interesting to see how the panel will, will come together. And uh, you've only now just issued, of course, the tender, but uh, the panel will still have to be put together. And, uh, you know, one, once we do have a little bit more detail at that time, we'll, 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 we'll revisit this uh, particular issue. I, I want to <laughs> begin to talk about... Um, maybe start off with inflation and and the tax base that we sit with right now one of the things that i think is a, is a real liability to the future sustainability of this country is the low tax base that we have even though there is a portion of course of very high income earners that some in this country feel can pay a lot more now of course that may be wading into a bit of a political space because the law is quite clear about who you can collect from and at what level, uh, percentages, etc., you do collect from them. That's quite explicitly clear. Uh, but the, the claim here that we do have a low tax base and largely middle class to higher end income earners that is is is, is seeking to, to make the country sustainable for all of the other things that the state needs to pay for is, is, is one consideration versus the fact that we sit with a lackluster economy in which uh, there has been, for the last at least two years or so, high levels of inflation that for the first time showed some really good signs uh, over the last week or two. Uh, how do we, or how do you manage this uh, and try to find the balance between the low tax base versus what the, what the economy is doing as a whole and whether, whether, whether that will impact the sort of revenues that you could possibly collect? Well, let, let's talk about two things. The first is the economy and the other is the tax base. You're quite correct that when the economy is struggling to grow, we are not creating new jobs. 
we are not creating new businesses and existing businesses struggle to grow. And that reflects through to the work we do, which is even more important why our compliance work that I referred to earlier on uh, becomes sharper and better over time because it does fill the economic slumps and cycles that we, that we uh, have experienced. Um, and of course, when you don't create jobs, you don't create new businesses, that limits the tax base. Every new job is an in increase to the tax base. Every new business is an increase to the tax base. The, the low tax base has to be put in context. Because very often people uh, misconstrue that. The first thing I always remind people is everybody pays tax. 62 million people pay tax because every time you go to a shop and buy anything, there's 15% VAT that you pay. There's excise duties on tobacco and cigarette and other products. So when you're a consumer, you pay tax. And VAT is not insignificant and customs, uh, uh, customs duties and, and excise duties are not insignificant. Um, so that's the first. The second is when people refer to a low income tax base, they talk about um, a few million people and they use the words that carry South Africans. That's not true. We have 16 million employees on our tax register. Of the 16 million, about half of them are below earning too little money to trigger a tax obligation, below the, um, uh, the tax paying income, uh, uh, threshold. Those who then are above is the other seven and a half million or so. And of course, they will then pay taxes, but you pay taxes in proportion to your income. So if you are only earning, uh, you know, 250,000 uh, Rand, you'll pay at the low rate. If you're earning a million Rand, you will obviously pay more money. So the amount of tax you pay is a reflection of your level of income. It's not an in as people try to make it out to be an inequitable or unfair system. I often in jest say to people, if you're paying a lot of taxes, you are actually very privileged because it means you're earning a lot of money. Now, if I went to the eight, the 8 million people who are below the threshold and ask them if they would pay taxes, um, if they received more money, they would willingly pay more taxes if it meant they got more money. So I think one must just be fair because there's also sometimes some political energy, political with a small P this time, energy behind those who want to claim that they carry the whole of, 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 of society because they are at the top end of the income earners. Uh, what they need to also acknowledge, and you and I are probably part of that, right? We are part of the privileged who are employed, who get a decent income and therefore we pay taxes. And how much of those taxes that, um, you know, that, of course, I, I would assume the majority of South Africans, you know, are paying their dues and are meant to be paying their dues. But would you say there is a high culture of tax avoidance, evasion? I'm not sure what the, what the proper terminology here is. Uh, dodges. Uh, you know, what is the the, the culture that, that we sit with right now in terms of South Africans accepting what their responsibility here is in terms of the great objective? Great question. So just clarity, avoidance and evasion are two different things. You are allowed to arrange your affairs in a way that you avoid paying unnecessary tax. Um, so for example, uh, tax is triggered on income once it is um, unconditionally, you have an unconditional entitlement to it and it can be calculated or ascertained as a monetary value. If you employ me and I know that I want to make uh, and you're going to pay me um, 100,000 rand and I know that I'm going to want to make 20,000 available 
for a acceptable charity. I could, before that money accrues to me as an income, I can enter into a sacrifice arrangement and say to you, um, I do not want to um, have that money accrue to me. You can make that money available um, as a donation towards a, a charity. Uh, so there are many ways that you can do to minimize your tax arrangements. Um, some companies may rent as opposed to buy a machinery because rental uh, uh, um, rental uh, payments are deductible for tax purposes. So there are many other ways that you can do. That's avoiding paying unnecessary tax. Evasion is breaking the law. Now, to your other question, when you are a salary earner, earning no other income, you generally have no legal room to manipulate your taxes because you earn a simple salary, um, your payroll administrator determines how much tax should be deducted, um, they pay the money and transfer to SARS, it doesn't even end up in your bank account. And so there's very little opportunity for about 5 million of the, uh, of the 8 million income earners. There's about for, for, for just over 5 million of them, there's been little opportunity to fiddle with that. The people who can fiddle are people who are wealthy, people who have other forms of income from business activities, from investments, from overseas assets. Um, they can create trusts, they can create companies. Um, and so there's lots of ways for structuring the arrangements in a way that which they are entitled to to minimize their, their 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 income or their tax liability, but many of them then also cross the line from avoidance to evasion, and those are the ones that clearly, when we detect them, uh, we will follow that up and when necessary uh, prosecute. Okay, we are talking at this time at 24 minutes now before 9 o'clock uh, to Edward uh, Kisvetter, the uh, SARS commissioner. The, we're talking about uh, all areas of revenue collection. Um, the recovery is what we've been talking about uh, from 2019, where uh, Mr. Kisvetter, of course, highlighted two areas for us that has certainly improved things. One is, um, you know, uh, confidence within the revenue service. That is a very key component, confidence and trust. And, of course, the, the second, but the sort of mechanisms that have been put in place to to, to collect revenue where previously there have been a, a less than attentive approach to looking at all of these sorts of areas, including the work that has now been done to to to, to seek a, 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 or to issue a tender essentially to, to get these uh, tax professionals to work with SARS to close the loopholes wherever the loopholes may well uh, be. And there, there's a sense when I talk to business people, when I talk to, 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 to other taxpayers, etc., that they feel that you you seem to be really you know closing the taps and looking at all avenues etc we we've seen the letters that are being issued uh, for 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 monies that are owed of course to the revenue services and scenarios which uh, i know you were in and out of court with with some businesses about uh, contestations about you know taxable um, you know monies on on vat etc and how much vat must be paid those are all very complex matters which of course you know the the, the time wouldn't quite allow us to get into but I want to just quickly talk about those that, that are breaking the law, you know, the, the, those that are, are dodging the payments that they're meant to be, be doing. What, what is the process that, that is being un, uh, undertaken in terms of how to hold them accountable? Uh, because uh, in one instance, of course, SARS has the ability to, to seek an audit or a review uh, of a, a taxpayer, and, and, and this will then determine whether SARS is owed money. And then in other instances, I've heard some business people say SARS has just simply come into their bank account and taken the money that they believe is owed to them. And, and of course, there was questions about how legal that is. So I'm not certain whether that is entirely true, that, you know, the law does allow you to, to, to take monies, um, you know, from bank accounts of individual taxpayers when, of course, you believe money is owed to them. Is that the case? And and if so, why? Can you maybe just explain that to us? Uh, yes, the law 
allows SARS. And let me first say that we have to act within the law. And if we don't, a citizen, a taxpayer is perfectly entitled to seek recourse in law. Um, first, by going to obviously, if, the, if it is in uh, from one of the offices within SARS, to escalate that to me directly. Uh, if they believe that they've not been successful, they can go to the tax ombudsman, um, uh, the tax ombud, um, and ultimately they can take us to court, <clears throat> and then we have to account. So we don't have the free reign to just do what we have to. And I know many, uh, many seek to paint that picture. Um, but the first, if you if you owe us any outstanding debt that you have not disputed, SARS will first uh, engage with you um, in a professional and friendly way to ask you to pay the debt or to consider approaching us for a debt repayment arrangement. Under certain provisions uh, for a compromise of debt, there's a very formal process, it's described in law. If you ignore that initial engagement, and then SARS is allowed in law to look into any of your bank accounts, and if, there are, if you have money in the bank account, then clearly you're not paying, not because you don't have the means, you simply choose to frustrate the process. In those instances, there is a provision in law, it's a third party agent appointment that SARS can appoint a bank or any other party that has money on your behalf um, to deduct that money so that the tax can be settled. The third issue is if you don't have any money and you don't engage SARS to come to some arrangement, SARS can also attach some assets. Um, if they believe that there is a flight risk. Um, so long before we get uh, uh, to appointing a, or going to the court and asking for a civil judgment uh, for the monies to be paid or an, a, an asset to be attached, we would have engaged a taxpayer on a more friendly and professional basis. But like any other business, if you don't pay what is due to you, that business is entitled to use the courts to recover its cost. And so this is all that SARS is doing. The, the issue is less about the use of those instruments. It is whether some people feel a moral obligation to pay tax or otherwise. Uh, but I can assure you that we have to act within the law um, and the two million instances of debt cases we've resolved last year, many of them would have just been a, a phone call. Um, you know, I often, as many people do, you may forget uh, that you have an obligation due. I actually appreciate the call when someone says, oh, by the way, your levies are due and it should have been paid yesterday, you forgot. Um, and I help myself by scheduled payments, but where I haven't put a scheduled payment in place, a friendly reminder is actually very helpful. Um, so it's a range of instruments that we use, and we only use what we call the hard enforcement instruments where taxpayers have not cooperated. Mm. In terms of specific harder issues, uh, clearly so there is the civil matter, and that's the matter that can be settled um, with money. And then there is the criminal matter which has to go to trial if we believe that not only is there a tax civil offense, but there's also a criminal offense, an yeah. issue of money laundering or, or theft or stuff like that. Yeah, because the, case, the, the illicit economy, uh, sorry, is what I actually want to, want to go to now very quickly yes. because, um, you know, drugs and illicit cigarettes, the tobacco industry, notorious, 
you know, for, for allegedly not paying taxes. And I know that even there was some, you know, during the previous darker days of, of the revenue service, there were even talk about how these criminal syndicates had, had wanted to infiltrate SARS with a view to to relax the attention away from them so that they can continue to not pay some of some of these taxes. And of course, I mean, there, there are almost, I want to call them religious arguments around uh, the tobacco industry where, where, you know, some say they are illicit cigarettes and others say they, they're not so illicit. And the only thing that makes them illicit it is whether they pay taxes or not um and and so and so we we sit with with scenarios in which you have the criminal illicit economy that that functions uh, quite quite extensively and we've seen we've seen some police uh, raids recently where you know drugs to the tune of millions of, of rands have been confiscated etc so there, there's one that particular element and then there of course are the guys that deliberately try and, and dodge the system to try and and ensure that their financial outflows are out of this country, you know, into certain safe havens where they would be shielded from from paying certain taxes. How sophisticated would you say the systems of the revenue services are, and, and, and quite truthfully looking at this, to to try and close the taps there because it is it is potentially there where where, where, you know, you sit with a, a, a culture, really, of, of people that's not just seeking to, to avoid paying taxes, but they also do so in a way that is pretty criminal. And so what sort of progress is being made to target the illicit economy? So one of the things that have been, if I just take the tobacco industry, for example, is SARS um, in law, as we understand it, um, is entitled to employ smart technologies at the manufacturing so that we can... So firstly, every tobacco manufacturer has to be registered. Um, and there are certain conditions under which the license is granted. One of those conditions is that, um, the, that there must be surveillance of the manufacturing. Uh, uh, in, uh, establishment. Uh, secondly, there has to be um, record keeping that shows the raw material, where it was bought, the quality of the raw material, because excisable products like tobacco and oil and metals have different grades, and every grade has a different value, and every uh, and, and excise duties or customs duties are levied on the value. So there's a lot of manipulation of values, um, and therefore we have to have the sophisticated technologies to manage the entire supply chain um, from the point of import, if something comes uh, from abroad, to the point of sale or export if something goes out again. And, and you have to ask yourself the question, a group of tobacco uh, manufacturers are opposing in law, in court, are opposing this effort by SARS to improve our surveillance technology and to be more aware. If you've got nothing to hide, uh, quite clearly, why would you oppose such an action? So these uh, smart technologies, CCVT ca cameras and related technologies, we are busy rolling that out. We have obviously, uh, in parallel with that, uh, appealed the court ruling. I hope that in the longer term, uh, we will be successful uh, through the courts, because if we don't survey um, and, and, and enhance the record keeping, uh, this value chain will always be susceptible to, un uh, to, to unscrupulous um, criminals for that, for that matter. Uh, with oil, uh, you know, for example, the, we have a, a, a User of, a wholesale user of oil has to demonstrate that the oil that they paid was imported because that uh, they've paid duties on, then they're entitled to claim the rebate on the duties. And there again, we have to have assized equipment to measure from the point of purchase through to the point of consumption the use of oil. Otherwise, um, you are not entitled to claim. Uh, many people, some of the schemes is what we call a carousel scheme. If you export a product, you're entitled to claim the VAT, for example. Um, and so we find that many people 
declare a particular cargo, whether it's a train or a, a truck or a container, declare it for export, um, but the goods never leave. So they declare it merely to entice, to, to, to impermissibly and fraudulently have access to the refund. All of this work, we then also use sophisticated um, uh, machine learning. And last year, uh, the intelligence work that we have done through fraud risk detection has yielded just in VAT, um, refund fraud um, has yielded 41 billion rand. But that sounds impressive, but if you look at the size of the problem, uh, we are scratching the surface. We have so much more work to do. And then, of course, SARS is very dependent on the South African police for investigations, for ensuring that a case file uh, can be brought to the NPI, NPA so that there's a good chance for a successful prosecution. And then we are dependent on the walks um, for serious uh, uh, priority crimes. We're dependent on the um, NPA for uh, enrolling these matters and taking it to court. And the process is slow. It is often frustrating. Um, and, you know, when I meet with uh, my political principles, I point out why it is so important to invest in the criminal justice system, in SARS, in the NPA, to invest in the physical as well as the technology infrastructure at our ports of entry, our borders are porous. People come through our borders without documentation. We have no way of enforcing our laws. Yeah. Um, and all of this not only erodes economic value, it also erodes social cohesion because we have to coexist with these negative social elements. Mm. I have a couple of WhatsApp messages from listeners and I'm going to maybe try to do like a, 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 a quick round in just a couple of minutes on some of these questions that listeners want to put to you, Mr. Kisveter, but uh, in, just in terms of some of the other areas I want to just build on from that last conversation is why you seemingly have, have, have gone to target the e-commerce, um, you know, area, um, not necessarily is it this African ones, but the Timus and the Sheens, you know, a lot of people were terribly annoyed with this uh, because they can no longer, you know, get some of their things that uh, for as cheaply as they would have by, by ordering through these these particular platforms. And, and of course, some of them felt that that's so what, you know, if, if they're getting things for, for cheaper because this is the only way they can potentially afford it. Um, and, and now with the, with the mechanisms that have been put in place by SARS, it effectively makes the importation of some of those goods are a lot more expensive. Why did you target Timu and Sheen? So firstly, we don't target anyone. The issue with e-commerce is a very peculiar issue because the legislation and the policy uh, framework within SARS for small parcels is dated. In the days that Older people like myself, uh, when we became excited, when Amazon.com, you could buy a book uh, or you, you bought an overseas item, they were in drips and drabs. Uh, they came in maybe a few hundred, a few thousand a month. And it was easy to, uh, to deal with that. And the customs was declared on the value and the customs was paid. As the volumes increases, increased, it's harder to um, administer on an individual item the tax because it would mean that goods are held up at our ports of entry, whether it's an airport, if it comes in by the plane or a seaport or a land port. Um, and so a 20% um, minimum tax duty was imputed for small items and not for the actual schedules that are legally uh, indicating how much duty should be paid. And it was an administrative issue to deal with the growing volumes. Now, the volumes are so big that they come in, in 
tens of thousands of containers and thousands, if not millions, of items that come in uh, every month to the point where we now experience a significant, a few things. Firstly, a significant uh, revenue of leakage, customs duty leakage, because we are collecting a flat 20% for items that may have a duty of 45% or 30%. And so it's rectifying that. Secondly, one of the things why duties are imposed by governments is to balance local manufacturing with imports or local businesses to protect them from unfair competition. Now, if you, if you are a high street retailer a, in South Africa, a ShopRite, a Woolworths, uh, or an Ackermans, then you pay duty on every item that you bring in. And you pay duty at the value that the item has, uh, is scheduled to pay duty. If you're coming in as an online retailer, you're not treated the same under the current practice. And so, of course, the, you and I as retailers will benefit by buying online because there's an unfair advantage to the online importer because they're not paying the tax that the shop rights and the, the Woolies uh, and, 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 and other retailers have to pay. And so that also has created an economic distortion and inequity that has to be addressed. So we've engaged with, with the retailers. Remember, it's not the online retailers, uh, the Amazon doc, uh, the Amazons or the chains or the Temus that are paying the taxes. The user will pay the taxes. Um, and it's just about bringing about more equity. Uh, we are still looking at how do we increase our own capability to enforce that so that we don't cause unnecessary delays. Um, and then also we find um, that there is a lot of abuse of declarations. So a lot of the goods that come in are often underdeclared or declared as an incorrect item so that people can also uh, arbitrage uh, by paying lower taxes. And that also creates an economic distortion and also um, a revenue opportunity leakage for SARS and therefore for government. Hey, so was... there's nothing untoward about it. It is simply applying the law as we should have applied it. Yeah. And we have given the over... we've given the online retailers engaged with them already earlier this year, have given them time to adjust their processes and their plants. Um, and given them enough warning. So the first uh, um, uh, implementation was to introduce VAT, because all goods that are come into the country for consumption is VATable, um, followed by the correct duty. And it's a phased approach, ultimately to equalize, uh, level the playing fields for local retailers with online details. All right. Uh, there's, of course, a number of WhatsApp messages in, and we don't have a lot of time left, and I'm going to try and get, get through some of them. Uh, but here's a, a listener, of course, or some of them uh, feeling that, you know, SARS, as they would put it, you know, protects and works for the ultra-rich. Um, you know, and, and just, I think it was this week that we heard, um, you know, uh, what is Johan Rupert is now again the, the richest man in Africa. Um, and, of course, part of his wealth is that, you know, he, he owns uh, Richmond, and um, it's, it's the world's, you know, most valuable valuable watchmaker and producer etc and a whole host of other holding companies that sits in switzerland and elsewhere that that of course he owns um, the question of course to pick up from the listeners is 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 how people like rupert and others get as rich as as they are and um you know whether to, whether whether sars you know is is attentive to not just of course mr rupert himself but you know generally the ultra rich that that seemingly doesn't appear to be slowing down in terms of their wealth accumulation and wondering whether they are the ones that are, are paying equitable tax you know to the to the tax man so firstly i think that when people have made their money honestly 
and they've earned it uh, and have paid the taxes that are due, I have no issue with that. As opposed to people who run criminal syndicates and do you know, illicit activities in order to make money. So a clear distinction. The second, we spoke about this earlier on, is every businessman, every wealthy person is allowed in law to arrange their affairs in a way that the law permits it. So if you want to uh, move from country one to country two because you want to diversify your risk, uh, because you want to manage and spread your cost, uh, because you want to take advantage of a jurisdiction that is tax favorable, you're allowed to do that. And provided you make the right applications, the declarations, and you go through the procedure, you're entitled to do that. doesn't matter what your name is uh, or how known you are. The example you use is obviously a very, very known, uh, well-known individual. So let's not focus on him, let's focus on the principle. Um, what we are concerned about is when people break the law in the way they arrange the affairs. Um, and we have had many instances with wealthy people where we are in court, where we believe that they've manipulated the system to seek only a tax advantage. So what the law does not allow is that you enter into an arrangement that has no commercial rationale, that is purely there for um, uh, having a positive tax implication. In those instances, uh, the law steps in. So I, I think there's a lot of conversation around a wealth tax or not, and that's beyond my pay grade. The minister decides on tax policy, but we have a very clear position that in South Africa, our focus should not be on raising taxes, but on raising administrative efficiency so that we collect the taxes that are due. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, 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 and just then on that point, people. yeah, and just on that point, uh, a subject that I didn't really have the time to get into because we're on nine o'clock, um, is the issue on grey listing and 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 whether we we're making uh, significant enough progress to to get off that list. Uh, how much from 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 because uh, look at in part as I would understand it, that we've been grey listed because there aren't sufficient enough controls in place, um, to monitor uh, you know where income streams are, the outflows, etc., so on and so forth and the declarations that are meant to be made even by for instance npos and the religious institutions and so on and so forth the list is quite 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 wide uh, so in, in just of course in a couple of seconds or so if, if you're able to to give us some sort of insight into whether we're making sufficient ground at least based on what is your work your area of work whether you think gray listing um will be no longer a a, a scenario for us to worry about in future so we are making good progress within SARS in the issues that relate to on the gray listing list. But, but, but FATF looks at the whole of government. And the big concern for South Africa is money laundering and uh, illicit financial flows. And what FATF has basically said, firstly, look at your policies and procedures, your laws that will limit that. And secondly, demonstrate that you can enforce them and hold people to book, make sure people end up in jail. It's on the latter part that I think we need to do more. So we've done a, a significant amount in the last few years to make sure that we address deficiencies in laws and in regulations, um, but we need to build administrative capacities within SARS, within the FIC, uh, within the Hawks, uh, within SIPSI, uh, one of the big things was beneficial ownership because you know if if you have uh, you use a special purpose vehicle or a trust or a company to mask the activity um, and the authorities cannot see who the beneficial owners are because there's some arbitrary name that you've called the entity uh, so those are some of the things that we have addressed are busy addressing uh, but ultimately, what FATF wants to say is, do people end up in jail? Can you successfully prosecute uh, money laundering and uh, terror financing and illicit financial flows? Until we do that, 
uh, we, it'll be hard to get off the list. Oh, yeah, and, and and just quickly on the on the two pot system, uh, you've said that 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 thirty thousand rand is taxable, and where where monies are owed to SARS, and there is now an income, be it through this thirty thousand rand of the two pot system, that 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 those could be taxed as as it were. Is that correct? Let me first compliment you for when I before you when you were introducing the the, the show and the conversation, uh, you pointed out that people must use this money for a worthy cause and not for a holiday. And I want to underline that a hundred percent because this is really money, for, as we said in, when we grew up in Kensington for Oda, it's not for now. And what is important is that when the money was deducted and contributed to your pension fund, it wasn't taxed. That's the main reason, because it's future income, and therefore it will only be taxed when you draw on it for income. Now you're drawing on it earlier, which means you trigger the tax event earlier. It's not something uncommon, something or strange. You simply are drawing your income from your tax, from your retirement savings earlier, and therefore you trigger an earlier tax. But there's another important uh, consideration. Because you're drawing it earlier, while you're earning other income, you're likely to pay at a higher rate because all income for this year will be added together and that may trigger a higher tax liability. Uh, normally when you retire, and that's the only form of income, your tax, uh, uh, your income drops and therefore your tax rate will drop. So we, all we are saying is three things for taxpayers. After they take your advice and not just draw the money uh, for some uh, trivial need. The first is make sure you're registered for tax before you apply for a directive. The second is make sure you have no outstanding returns because anything will, that can trigger a delay in the directive is gonna frustrate you. Mm -hmm. Make sure mm -hmm. that you have no other debt because other debt that you owe to SARS will also be deducted. And so you may actually end up getting nothing out after all of these things are taken care of. So make sure you're registered before you apply for the directive. Make sure you have no outstanding returns. And if you have debt, make sure you have entered an agreement with SARS to pay that debt over a time, because if not, then that debt will also be deducted from the amount that you withdraw. All right. Uh, you know, there, there's, again, lots of areas. Uh, lots of listeners want, um, you know, uh, answers to a couple of things. I want to talk a little bit about service delivery uh, at SARS offices and those queues and the systems and the online and so on and so forth. So I'm hoping Mr. Kisvetter will get into your diary at some stage later in the year again so we can do a round two of this particular conversation. Uh, there's a number of issues, of course, that we've canvassed here this morning, um, but there's a lot more to get through. So hopefully we will get some time in Mr. Kisveter's diary later in the year to have a part two of this particular very important conversation. Thank you very much for coming on to Radio 786 this morning.